The history of science is littered with great ideas which later proved to be unsupported speculation and explanation for human origins are no exception. Some hypotheses have gone quietly into the night, while others never really had any support and have grown into fringe conspiracy theories. A not-so-well-known example would be Alistair Hardy's proposition of aquatic apes. Hardy argued that most of the traits unique to humans were due to an aquatic phase in our lineage after diverging from other apes. Most scientists never gave it much credence for reasons we'll see later, but it did get a handful of very vocal supporters. The most outspoken of them being journalist Elaine Morgan, who, as we'll see, like most conspiracy advocates, has no problem distorting science in the name of better science. It's the bicentenary of Charles Darwin, and all over the world, eminent evolutionists are anxious to celebrate this, and what they're planning to do is to enlighten us on almost every aspect of Darwin and his life and how he changed our thinking. I say almost every aspect because there's one aspect of this story which they have thrown no light on and they seem anxious to skirt around and step over it and talk about something else. So I'm going to talk about it. It's the question of why are we so different from the chimpanzees? We get the genetists keeping on telling us how extremely closely we are, hardly any genes of difference, very, very closely related. And yet, when you look at the phenotypes, there's a chimp, there's a man, there's astoundingly different, no resemblance at all. I'm not talking about airy-fairy stuff, about culture or psychology or behavior. I'm talking about ground-based, nitty-gritty, measurable, physical differences. There, that one is hairy and walking on four legs. That one is a naked biped. Why? For the record, anatomical differences with respect to form between humans and chimpanzees are a matter of proportion due mostly to a few changes in development. However, structurally speaking, there are virtually no differences between us. Also, humans have far more body hair than chimps and gorillas, but ours isn't as long, dark, or coarse. This will become important later. I mean, then, if I'm a good Darwinist, I've got to believe there's a reason for that. If we change so much, something must have happened. What happened? Now, 50 years ago, that was a laughably simple question. Everybody knew the answer. They knew what happened. The ancestors of the apes stayed in the trees. Our ancestors went out onto the plain. That explained everything. We had to get up on our legs to peer over the tall grass or to chase after animals or to free our hands for weapons. And we had got so overheated in the chase that we had to take off that fur coat and throw it away. As I said, humans do have more hair follicles than other apes, but it's usually shed during embryonic development, and the remainder are too fine for us to see. Within the hominin lineage, significant hair reduction appears to be a relatively modern trait, probably limited to our species as evident from genetic studies, which put the loss at long, coarse body hair at less than 240,000 years ago. So this may have been a sexually selected trait rather than an adaptive one. I'd like to talk about just a handful of what have been called the hallmarks of mankind, the things that make us different from everybody else and all our relatives. Let's look at the naked skin. It's obvious that most of the things we think about that have lost their body hair, mammals with their body hair, are aquatic ones, like the gugong, the walrus, the dolphin, the hippopotamus, the manatee, and a couple of wallowers in mud like the um, babirusa. And you're tempted to think, well, perhaps, could that be why we are naked? I suggested that people said, no, 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 look. I mean, look over about the elephant. You've forgotten all about the elephant, haven't you? So back in 1982, I said, well, perhaps the elephant had an aquatic ancestor. Peals of merry laughter. That's crazy woman. She's off again. She'll say anything, won't she? But by now... Everybody agrees that the elephant had an aquatic ancestor. They've come round to agree that all those naked pachyderms had aquatic ancestors. Babirusa often reside near rivers and streams and are capable swimmers like nearly all mammals, but they don't often venture into water. Their activities in wet areas mostly involve social displays and competing for mate. Now on to the elephant. It is true that some of the first elephant fossils are commonly associated with marshes and were likely semi-aquatic in nature. However, the oldest elephants with soft parts preserved, the mastodons, still possessed a full coat of hair due to the fact that they lived in a cold climate. And in lieu of any good genetic data, it's unknown whether or not ancestral elephants were hairy or not. 
but a better explanation for the apparent hair loss in elephants is related to the constraints on large warm-blooded animals and the need to shed heat in a tropical environment. The same pattern is seen in other lineages as well. Just look at the dinosaurs, wherein smaller species often possess some form of insulating feathers, while the much larger forms lack any traces of them so they wouldn't overheat. The last stop out was the rhinoceros. Last year in Florida, they found extinct ancestors of rhinoceros and said, seems to have spent most of its time in the water. So this is a close connection between nakedness and water. This is completely wrong. Modern rhinos did not descend from semi-aquatic forms. Rather, the Aminodontids Morgan was alluding to were an isolated branch and were not the predecessors to the family Rhinoceridae. Rather, this family emerged in Asia and were primarily terrestrial. In fact, the only modern significantly semi-aquatic rhino, the Sumatran rhino, is the hairiest and smallest extant species. This group is also the earliest diverging member of the rhino family, implying that the last common ancestor of all extant rhinoceros were ancestrally hairy, and more modern forms have lost their hair as they've gotten bigger to increase heat loss just like the elephants, while their arctic-adapted kin retained their hair. As an absolute connection, it only works one way. You can't say... All aquatic animals um, are naked because look at the sea otter. But you can say that every animal that has become naked has been conditioned by water in its own lifetime or the lifetime of its ancestors. I think this is significant. The only exception is the naked Somalian mole rat, which never puts its nose above the surface of the ground. The only exception? Really? Human babies are fat. Uh, the last trimester uh, in pregnancy, the baby is, is putting on uh, uh, layers of fat. Now, this really just doesn't make sense if our ancestors were roaming the savannah plains or climbing trees. The only place it really makes sense is if uh, infants were, you know, exposed to a risk of drowning, uh, so that the, the increased adiposity, the increased buoyancy, would enable the mother to rescue the baby quickly and also obviously for thermoregulation. Actually, babies get fatter after birth during breastfeeding, which promotes maternal bonding and healthy brain development. This also reduces the risk of malnutrition since fat is primarily the body's insurance against famine. Also, the natural position for human infants when placed in water is to be face down, which promotes the risk of drowning. This is the reason why pediatricians instruct parents not to leave infants and young children unattended in water. Look at the fat layer. We have got under our skin a layer of fat all over. Nothing in the least like that in any other primate. Why should it be there? Well, they do know that if you look at other aquatic mammals, the fat that in normal land animals is deposited inside the body wall, around the kidneys and the um, intestines and so on, has started to migrate to the outside and spread out in a layer inside the skin. In the whale, it's complete. No fat inside at all, all in blubber outside. We cannot avoid the suspicion that in our case it started to happen. We have got skin lined with this layer. If the only possible explanation of why humans, if they're very unlucky, can become grossly obese in, in a way that would be totally impossible for any other primate, physically impossible. Something very odd about our fat lay never explained. If it isn't already obvious, much like a creationist, Morgan and her supporters tend to bring up evidence that contradicts their position but goes on pretending as if it actually supports them. Humans do tend to have more fat and less muscle than other apes, but it isn't like the blubber of whales and other aquatic mammals. Aquatic mammals store their fat more or less uniformly around the body, partly for insulation but mostly for energy storage and to maintain a streamlined shape. Humans, on the other hand, like other primates, store their fat around the thighs, waist, breast, buttocks for lean times. This also may be an exaggerated sexual trait, explaining why human females tend to store more fat than males and even why the theme of Rubenesque women appears in art and has so for tens of thousands of years in different cultures. Then take bipedality. Here you can't find anybody to compare it with um, because we're the only animal that walks upright on two legs. Actually, bipedalism has evolved multiple times. Moving on, Morgan's retelling of the mainstream explanation for bipedalism is mostly correct, but she left out a few details. For one, adopting a bipedal posture allows an organism to cool down faster and prevents the brain from overheating, which is especially advantageous in a savanna or desert environment. 
Bipedality also explains the reason why humans can afford to have much more body fat and less calorie draining muscle than other apes. After all, walking on two legs is much more metabolically efficient than knuckle walking and allows an individual to find, track, and literally run terrestrial prey into the ground rather than ambush hunting or sprinting, which most predators do. But you can say this, all the apes and all the monkeys are capable of walking on two legs if they want to for a short time. There's only one circumstance in which they always, all of them, walk on two legs, and that is when they're wading through water. Do you think that's significant? David Attenborough thinks it's significant as the possible beginning of our bipedalism. There's only one circumstance in which they always, all of them, walk on two legs, and that is when they're wading through water. There's only one circumstance in which they always, all of them, walk on two legs, and that is when they're wading through water. Actually, the most common reason for bipedal locomotion in other monkeys, but especially apes, is for carrying supplies and tools, and this has been confirmed under controlled conditions and field observations. Even without the anatomical adaptations that humans possess, chimpanzees in savanna environments have stronger tendencies towards bipedalism and, surprise, surprise, tool manufacturing. This has been the primary research of Dr. Jill Preetz and her colleagues who've documented a number of bizarre behaviors in addition to increased bipedality, typically not found in forest chimps, but common in fungoli savanna chimp culture.